Hello everyone, my name is Selena Mosley and on behalf of the organisers Oliver Kinross, I would like to welcome you all to London Build Online. So today's session is a panel discussion on women in construction, moderated by Christina Roy Riley and joined by Ruby, Paula, Sinead and Susan. Just a reminder that we actually have a women in construction speed networking event taking place at 5.15 for an hour long this evening. Everyone is welcome to join the networking session to discuss what is your organization doing to drive equality, diversity, inclusivity and change within the UK's construction industry. Just simply jump onto the website to register your details and join the session for free. So I hope you all enjoy this afternoon's session. I would like to hand it over to you now, Christina. Hi everybody. Thank you for, for joining this session today for London Build Online. I think all the other panelists are going to turn on their cameras and uh, turn on their microphones if uh, you can do that. So, um, Thank you for, for inviting us back. This is my third year uh, moderating uh, this session. So uh, it's great to be back at London Build, despite it being uh, slightly different circumstances. So um, just a little introduction from myself. I'm uh, Christina Riley. I'm at ISG uh, Limited. Um, I'm currently working on projects uh, in the healthcare sector, particularly down at uh, Royal Marsden Hospital at the moment. And I've been uh, in the construction industry now for around 30 years, doing various uh, roles in terms of site management and planning. I just want to uh, give you a little introduction. This year, 2020, will go down in history as one we will never forget, from having to deal with the first global pandemic for 100 years, impacting the lives in so many ways in industries that we once thought of as safe. Our thoughts are with those we have lost due to COVID-19, but also to those who have lost their livelihoods. Diversity and the climate emergency have been the top concerns this year, with the death of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and the emergence of a teenage activist Greta Thunberg, inspiring thousands on her school strike protests. Women have been shown to be great leaders during this time. For example, Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand, has led the world on the COVID response in her country. Role models like Greta and Jacinda can inspire us all, not only in life, but in all that we aspire to be. I'm now going to introduce our panel. Each panelist is going to introduce themselves and, uh, and then we're going to run into the questions. So um, first over to Paula, if you can introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paula Arkelwalla. I'm one of the social value managers for Boeig. I've been working in construction for over 20 years and with, with Boeig for the last two years. Um, projects that I look after are commercial, uh, construction and residential in London and the South East. Um, I also wear two hats. I'm also a qualified level six careers advisor. So I um, talk about construction and civil engineering. And I came from a very different industry into construction. I started off in the fashion and sportswear industry as a sportswear and engineering designer. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. Susan, would you like to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Ryle. I'm the technical director for Skanska Infrastructure. Um, my background is is a bit more traditional. I'm, I'm an engineer. Um, I have been in construction for 30 years this year, the last 20 with Skanska. Um, until this time last year, I was a project lead on a number of projects, which were a tremendous amount of fun, um, including Borough Viaduct, um, Bermondsey Dive Under, um, Humber Pipeline and the Waterloo International Terminal Redevelopment. Um, I now sit on infrastructure's leadership team and I'm working with a tremendous number of very clever people who are spending their time teaching me a lot of stuff that I didn't know before and I'm enjoying learning about. So, um, different challenge, lots of fun, great industry. Great, thank you Susan. Uh, Sinead, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sinead Kennedy. I work for Morgan Sindel Infrastructure. I am a health and safety environmental manager, so I'm not an engineer. I came through a little bit different. So I came through the uh, graduate program with Costain. I studied a bachelor of science in health and safety systems. 
been in the UK for eight years now, so eight years in construction, um, fantastic experience with Morgan Centre Infrastructure, I'm currently looking after the London Underground TfL projects, and also in my spare time, I'm studying a master's in occupational hygiene, so hoping to specialise in occupational hygiene, health and wellbeing going forward. Thank you. Great, well, that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Sinead. Uh, Ruby, over to you. Would you like to introduce Hi. yourself? Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. I think uh, it's, um, uh, I'm Ruby el -Kanzi. I'm a chartered architect and I'm very passionate about design and construction and therefore I am as well a senior construction design manager. I uh, work for Waits Construction in London, one of the most iconic, uh, as I would say it, um, uh, barrier projects in London Bridge. Um, in terms of my career, it's actually quite long. Uh, it's, it spans over 25 years. Um, I worked on very complex projects, and including master planning, sports, stadia, um, schools, um, and the, uh, army airports and, and navy um, uh, bases as well. I worked across the UK, in the US, and mainland China and Middle East. Um, I think I've, my experience is, 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 is stages across all the project um, life cycle, starting from tender to uh, handover. And proudly, I would I wouldn't be bragging about it, but I, I have won three international architecture design competition in the past, and has been acknowledged very by a number of our, uh, my clients uh, that I work for. Um, Construction projects, they have many challenges, and but I count myself very lucky that I had a, the opportunity to work uh, with outstanding and high caliber projects team and being able to give back to the community as well as a mentor, uh, as a public speaker and promoting diversity uh, as well as, as a, a, a career in construction to our uh, future generation. and recently just being more i mean not since last year i mean for the last eight years i've been working in reverse mentoring and fluid uh, uh, uh mentoring programs and there here we are and um, paving the ways for more women to join uh, the construction right uh, thank everybody thanks uh for for doing that so our first uh, question uh really goes to the heart of what we've all been going through the last uh, year in terms of uh, the pandemic. And uh, we've all been working uh, in different conditions. It's been a struggle for many of us. And I just really want to go around uh, the panel, how, how you found working uh, in the construction industry over the last 12 months with COVID-19, how things have changed for, for yourselves, how uh, uh, women have had to change their, their working practices in the industry and what's worked and what, what hasn't worked. So um, first, uh, because of, of the way everybody's lined up on my screen, I've got Paula first. Oh, it's always me first. Um, I think the last 12 months have been a real challenge. I mean, we I work for a French company. We had a policy where you could work from home one day a week before all of this. And we were very quick to move to Teams. Um, we've got Microsoft 365 champions, so we are able to work from home. Obviously, not everyone could every day. Um, I have regular meetings with our team, so social value is one of the things that's really become apparent during COVID. We've been trying to help our residents and our projects as much as we can, and obviously all the things that we plan to do, face-to-face, -face, community aspects, community projects, a lot of them had to change straight away to virtual. Um, and we're working with schools. I work as an enterprise advisor with a school in Tower Hamlets. So that straight away went to virtual, talking to the teachers. We've done a lot with Construction Youth Trust. Um, and obviously, because we knew what was coming from France, we could gear ourselves up for it. Uh, funnily enough, we were talking about it earlier, weren't we, ladies, about all the problems that you have from working from home. I've had uh, times when I've done presentations and my internet's gone off. So that's been quite fun, trying to connect it back again. Um, I think being female, we've got that kind of flex and flow. Um, we do kind of get on with it and you have to smile and you have to say, you know, it's not easy. One thing I, I, I would like is to continue doing some virtual uh, events and workshops, but also when we can go back to face to face, because it's really important, that kind of interaction. Um, and I'm probably all of us probably feel a little bit like that. Going forward for next year, 
hopefully we can get back to being on site a lot more. I can go to site. I was at site earlier today, which was lovely to see everybody. Um, it does sort of break up the day. Um, and I have found keeping exercise. I'm a very keen cyclist and I have a beautiful garden at home that I try and keep sort of up to grips with. And I think that's been really good for mental health as well, because I think we've all struggled with being told what we can and can't do. So that's kind of You've, uh, I've lost your sound for a second. Yeah. But um, that's great. No, thanks, uh, Paula. It was really interesting uh, to get your feedback on that. So thank you. We lost you. Oh, now we're back. That's right. Sorry. Yeah, so over to Susan. Uh, it's technology uh, playing up here. But um, yeah, Susan, if you can uh, let us know how, how you found the, the situation over the last 12 months with uh, COVID-19. Yeah, I think um, it's been very different. I think certainly at the beginning, I had absolutely no expectation that we would be here doing this in November. I think in my head, I thought oh, a couple of months. I don't know why I thought that when you look back, but that's how it felt. Um, we, I think we've moved really quickly to remote technology. Um, to Paula's point, we didn't have a regular working from home thing. It was more the exception. So we've it, it's been quite different for a lot of people. Um, I. I do feel remote from the project because I've tried to not visit them because I think my presence will be quite disruptive if you're trying to accommodate an extra person who's not normally there. You've got to make space for them. Um, so that has felt more remote. But I've also found it's a lot easier to meet with people that typically you would have to kind of drive around the country to pin down. It's been a lot easier to track people down and have really good conversations with them, which has been really positive. And I really think it's important that we we learn the positives from this period and we keep an element of remote working and keep that accessibility and we don't find ourselves in two years looking back and thinking oh, I'm traveling five days a week how did how did that happen and we just slot back into it so I think it it will be important to focus on what have we learned that has made a difference in a positive way and hold on to that and then also pick up the positive parts of how we used to work when we were much better connected. Um, I think technology to begin with, losing Wi-Fi, et cetera, was a little frustrating. I think we've all settled down and upgraded our Wi-Fi and worked out how things work. And there's a, there's a few less. Uh, you're on mute, which is always a favourite. Um, some big fines coming, I think, when we get back to work, if people are adding up the fines. I love that you go to one meeting and the fine's a pound and you go to another one and it's 10 pounds. Quite a difference. But um, yeah, I I think the, the next few months are going to be quite difficult. I think having the Christmas kind of slight break and then going back into January, which is typically challenging anyway, and we will be missing people even more having just seen them potentially. It's going to be, we need to be really careful with people in January for me. And then I think moving forward from there, the only way is going to be up and, and next year is going to be amazing. So. Yeah. yeah, we're all looking forward to, uh, well, this time next year, we can all be together in person and it'd be fantastic mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the Women in, Constru in Construction panel next year when we're all together. And did, so Susan and, and Paula, just on that, do you, have you found that actually while working at home is a fan has been a fantastic uh, sort of relief for, for so many of us um, but actually o over as the years gone on you start to realize that actually we do need some office working yeah oh. absolutely definitely I think you can have too many teams meetings <laughs> um, they tend to roll in you think oh we'll have one because it's we're available and then you miss your lunch break and then it rolls into the evening and like Susan said I'm quite lucky my contracts tend to be London South East and I live in London so it's not too bad if I needed to get out and about but if it was Scotland then I think Teams is great because you can have a short meeting everyone concentrates on it and then and then that's it but um, yeah I think it's here to stay to a certain extent but we do need interaction don't we we need to talk to our yeah. colleagues and friends face to face yeah. over a couple of yeah. <laughs> absolutely remember the days when we used to just meet for a coffee that's like a luxury now um, yeah, I, th I think it is really important to have that that face to face, and I think I think we'll value it more. I think historically, perhaps we've been a little selfish with people's time, and and turning up a bit late was okay, or cancelling at short notice was okay. 
and I, I think in the future that will be very different because we'll, we'll have more focused meetings, maybe be less selfish with other people's time. Yep. And we could talk about teams all day. I don't know about you, but I seem to live on teams. But um, <laughs> anyway, so Sinead, uh, you know, how, how have you found things over the last 12 months uh, working at Morgan Sindel? Um, how, how has, uh, you know, what, what's worked well, what hasn't worked well for you? Yeah, well, I actually, I was on site this morning, just like Paula. Um, anyone that knows me, I'm a very social person. And the flip side of working at home, um, I, I live by myself, can become very isolated sometimes. So I think, you know, the balance, the life uh, work balance has to suit the individual. And that's what we also have to bear in mind, too. Um, in terms of Morgan Sindel, uh, we have coped so well um the team everyone pulled together the reaction i think i mean like um getting older um you know with mature members of the team to move over to technology you know they might be resilient and um, reluctant to adapt those technologies and maybe buy into you know the new ones the new changes has been a little bit easier because we've had to like that you know the wi-fi the uh, connections the mute buttons it can be a struggle sometimes but i would say um definitely far more positives taken out of the day than than the negatives even the way we start our days now are far better you know the guys come in in the morning and they do staggered starts we've got more space it's less congestion they get better quality briefings in the morning probably a lot more productivity you know they finish earlier they leave earlier and um, they don't get on the tube when it's busy and um, so yeah definitely a tough tough time not without challenges but very um very a lot of satisfaction coming from it and a lot of hard work and a good payoff i would say do you find um that i've noticed sort of over the last 12 years 12 years 12 months that's uh that for me uh, well i've got an app on my iphone and it pops up and gives me my fitness and it's told me in the last uh, i think the last few weeks that i've done exactly half the amount of exercise this year that yeah. i did last year and I just wonder, while, while we're all working at home and, it, and, you, and you'd think that uh, we'd, we'd actually have more time to do things like exercise uh, in terms of our well, looking after our well-being, actually we're doing less exercise because we're not yeah. out, out and about and, uh, and doing, you know, just walking to work. Absolutely. I I have a Fitbit and, you know, it tells you get up every hour and do 250 steps. Now, I'm not wearing it today. It's not on me. But when I do remember to wear it, you know, you do need that physical reminder. Get up, walk, move. And you don't actually realize how much movement you do in a day, especially going on a site visit, doing a site tour inspections, going around, engaging with everybody. It really does add up. And I think everyone will be have the same common ground that I struggled at the beginning, you know, um, so Especially when you're at home, you might be eating foods in what normally eat. You might be stress eating or a coping mechanism and turn to that comfort and then not get the exercise. But yeah, it's so important to get up and get out and, and look after your well-being. And even going out and meeting a friend in the park or just something like that, it's, it's really, really lovely and nice. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Ruby, last but not least, so how, <laughs> how, how, how have you found things at, at weights in terms of look, uh, you know, looking after yourself in terms of uh, uh, working from home or going into the office? Have I been, uh, have I been uh, quite flexible in, in the way your work practices are? Well, since the beginning, I think I'm, I, I, I count myself lucky that I'm working for weights. Uh, the culture and uh, flexible hours and flexible working, supporting mothers, it's all there. I mean, even prior to the pandemic. Um, but for me, as I mentioned earlier, that I'm, I'm an architect by practice. And the reason that I, I crossed over to, uh, to construction is to be closer to the build and see the product of my design. Now it's not my design, but the design that I manage. So since, the, since we started work, I mean, all the technical team and my, in my current projects, we've been um, offset, I would say. Now we're being asked to, to work from home. So the 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 whole i mean operation team they were on site that would allow to add her to the government um guidelines so we have we freed more space for the ops team and um, and and the guys who work from site 
but then again uh, in, introducing um, the, um, uh, the, the teams and skypes that help to to actually for me in terms of design management i don't need really to be on site every day so in this way i look at the positive side that actually gave me more time in terms of working more efficient uh, with the design team cutting as susan said earlier the time to try try to track everyone train delays the car park all this has been eliminated and all the focus has been on the final results when we're going to get to the final sign off of this piece of design because i work on dmb so it's all targets it's all program and things need to be achieved quickly to so we can feed in the site activities so in this way that works perfectly but at the beginning it was i missed that interaction again with my site walk around i start very early 7 30 or 7 o'clock am i would like to go around on a site walk around with the foxes and and see the building just right when not every everyone on site the the, the operation is, is haven't started yet and then you would come back and you would be on your tour all the time but then suddenly you are just in the front of a computer screen and yeah it's it's it was challenging but now it's became the norm and i think we just we just have to take this as a a, a better way and adapt to it but definitely not all week one day or two days to break the rhythm and get in touch again with the site and with the uh, uh, with the site team and the designers uh, in the building site. That will that that is that proved to be now. I mean, recently much better than complete screen relationship. So, um, because I, I as a planner, I've, I I get involved in design meetings, in project meetings, client meetings. Do you find that now we've all moved on to Teams, that uh, running technical meetings is better in terms of communication, or do you find it actually more of a hindrance, and you'd rather be in a room where you can spread out drawings and and have a more interactive session? Because obviously. On teams, only one person can really sort of talk at a time. Often in a meeting room, there's there's probably more interaction. I just wondered how you felt. Uh, now we're on. Now a lot of us are using Teams. If it's better, um, uh, my perspective, it's better. Sometimes some meetings need you need that interaction. If you were with sketching yeah do some sketches on a whiteboard i miss the whiteboard or on the drawings but we can do that with other means i mean we've got a, a, is it blue i'm not sure not adobe or powerpoint and i think i found i, I found it more efficient to have the the team meetings but definitely you need to have sometimes that brainstorming if somebody works on a design i don't work on the design that's for the architects they need that meetings yeah yeah okay thank you thank you for that so our next question that just to sort of follow on really is how do we continue to engage with the local communities in terms of promoting women in construction post covid that's a question for Sinead working backwards <laughs> Yeah, um, unfortunately, before all the lockdown, we had a family day and I'm sure everyone has organised a family day on their sites where, you know, members of the team, site team come in, they do the walk around, kids, young girls, nieces, daughters, and, you know, just have a chat about, you know, engineering, construction, uh, STEM. We had uh, also um, an open doors initiative it's basically an open open doors is where you live with the, the local community college and then they come in and have a walk around we had this all scheduled before lockdown and obviously lockdown came around and everything was cancelled so going forth for us again adapting technology in virtual tours i'm sure everyone's been on a virtual tour on site so facilitating that um with the colleges and um, you know 
things like flogs, you know, we're adapting again, we're like influencers here, flogs where, um, you know, engineers or graduates or apprentices go out, they do their video. Um, in more extensive infrastructure, we've got a YouTube channel and basically it's a whole takeover. So we're definitely looking at all those avenues where we can still engage, so we're not missing out and missing out on those opportunities of engaging young girls or young women or influence them, you know, into the industry and, and moving forward. So yeah, it's been really innovative actually, and it's, it's quite in line with what we've adapted now in our day-to-day -day, um, lives and so coming to work. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, and technology going forth and making sure that we are engaging with the community. And do you, do you find, uh, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, area really, uh, do, do you find the, the, the next generation are actually more engaged because you're doing things through the computer, you're doing it online, we can actually demonstrate uh, the technology, the, the 3D modeling, stuff that, that kids are really interested in. So, I mean, do you, do you find compared to physical visits against virtual visits, uh, is it something that actually is going to bring more uh, younger people into the industry? I believe so. I think social media is the pinnacle of everything these days. You know, kids are on um, Instagram, YouTube. You know, we're here today. We're having this chat via a virtual platform and um, LinkedIn, another source. And definitely you can get out there, influence. And uh, hopefully somebody somewhere, maybe one person might take it on board and, and, and come and join us in, in, in the, the fun in, in industry of construction. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it is a great platform. You know, we all have phones, we have iPads, and uh, kids right. kids have all the technology to hand. Right. Thanks for that, Sinead. So, uh, Susan, how's uh, so with Nanska, have uh, have you noticed any differences in terms of uh, how you interact with uh, your um, local community areas, like such as schools and colleges, uh, targeting? Um, you know, the next generation during uh, the last 12 months, if it, you know, has it changed considerably from Scouts' point of view? I, I think that initially the focus was on keeping the projects going and making sure that everyone was safe and could get there safely. I think then, as with a lot of things, as time's gone on and we've appreciated this isn't ending anytime soon, the, the sites find different ways to connect with the local schools and the local communities. I think where we perhaps are going to struggle a bit more with that different way of communicating is reaching the parents, because I think it's actually more about influencing the parents rather than the, the, than the kids and the young women, because I think when you see what we do and appreciate you can do pretty much anything in our industry, then it will engage in, and it does engage with young people. But if their parents don't think that's a suitable profession for their child, then that's where I think you struggle. And I think that's where the remote communication makes us a little bit more remote from parents. And that's something we'll need to pick up and influence when we can have more face to face. But I think it's great, as with many things in our industry, how we've adapted really quickly and, and not just said, right, well, OK, we can't do that. So we'll leave that till next year. It has continued after a, a sort of a, a hiatus to start off with while we worked out how, how we were going to operate in our brave new world. And do, do you think we, um, through the technology, we're reaching more girls and more women through these new, through the new technologies? Do you think we're actually reaching out better um, in terms of recruiting more women into the industry? Uh, I don't think for young people we may be doing that, but I think for returners or people who are considering a career in the industry, the fact that they can see we can work flexibly will be reaching a lot more people. I think maybe I'm just going from how I remember when I was at school, which is a long time ago. We don't need to talk about that. I don't think I would have any appreciation of, all oh, I need to be able to work flexibly. I, I, I would like to live in this part of the country but and not that part of the country. It was kind of all about, oh, that's interesting, that looks exciting. But I think when you're perhaps, you know, late teens, early twenties, it is about being able to be flexible and and finding construction accessible. I think that's something we really need to concentrate on is the, the kids that are interested now, I think, are possibly 
con converts, but what about the kids who don't appreciate how accessible and how interesting our industry is? And how do we explain that? Yeah, it's a it's, it's a good question, isn't it? And um, you know, what what was the answer in terms of accessibility? Is you know, we're we're collectively responsible, aren't we? It's you mm -hmm. know, we we all have busy jobs. Um, we we can all actually influence uh, people into the industry, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think companies can have a you know sort of a just a just innovative ways of 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 making it more accessible and 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 I think certainly the last 12 months that that has um certainly helped to reach out to more younger people I think but thank you for that Paula so um how well sure did you say your um your experience is in career, career careers yes yeah. so yes. I was uh retrained so I came from not the same as these ladies, I came from fashion. So I came from fashion into construction. So when the Olympics started, I was working with projects then at Canary Wharf and I got my careers qualification. And it's very interesting that 65 to 75% of jobs that young people are gonna be doing in the future have don't even exist yet. A lot of them are computer related. So VR, AR, BIM. We, as a civil engineering sort of tier one contractor, we're very experienced in that. And certainly when I go out and talk to, uh, you know, 16 to 18 year olds at school and even younger ones and particularly females that we want to get into the industry to talk about the different types of jobs and I do use civil engineering quite a lot rather than just construction because perception is everything particularly as Susan said with with parents and with teachers they still think we're laborers on site you know all of the, the original connotations of builders um, and we know ourselves there's so many different jobs in the industry it's not just one size fits all um, and we've done quite a lot of virtual talks and the same as Sinead was saying we had everything planned we had all the open doors and I worked to this morning I was at the uh, the old Royal London Hospital Whitechapel that's one of my projects and that was a very unusual project and that was you know we couldn't do it anymore so we use you know a timeline we've got um, drones um, it is difficult and getting young people to understand that civil engineering construction is booming you know one of the things that was mentioned this morning they're going to be spending more money in infrastructure you know if you're thinking about maybe going into leisure and tourism certainly this is another route particularly for females you know that the, the money's there we, we need more women to sort of make a, a quality balance um, out and at Boig we have uh, we link which is a female um, a committee I'm on it um, it was started in France a few years ago um, and we have different topics and we support females in the industry and in our company and we're very lucky our chair uh, person for Boeing is a lady and and that makes a big difference I think we've got a lot of senior directors that are female as well so mentoring I'm a mentor and I've been mentored and men, I've been a mentee as well um, and trying to get um, women who've come from professional industries who've maybe been redundant or made or, or getting them back in and that then influences their children at school because if they come back into an industry like construction they then will tell their boy, uh, children to uh, boys and girls to come into it and not maybe go into what would be traditionally thought of like accountancy or like a lawyer or a solicitor and think of uh, construction and civil engineering instead but it's not easy and do, do you think um we as an industry we're good enough at promoting the different types of jobs because isn't there over something like over 60 different careers that that you can have in the construction oh, construction sector and the rest um i mean you know straight away you think of uh, you know the technical aspects but then you've got hr you've got media you've got social value which was originally known as corporate social responsibility that was the original title for for area and that's huge because during COVID people are thinking I'd like to do something for my community you know we've really suffered in my area I'd like to give back um, and those kind of roles are, are sort of becoming more apparent but yeah there's so many as I said virtual and BIM is a big area and we do quite a lot with local schools to, to engage with them um, lots of uh, morning sessions um, through Zoom um, which again has been quite interesting I never used Zoom before so that was a bit hit and miss um, and it's hard because I'm used to standing up in front of a group of people and now I'm talking to a screen half the time you, you don't see anybody and it's a bit like being a comedian on stage I, I don't know if anyone else feels like that 
<laughs> you just you're waiting for that reaction so um it, it's not easy but we're, we're trying aren't we yeah, yeah yeah that's great so ruby um how so over in weights are you um how how do you see um best practice in terms of uh, post covid uh, staying in touch with uh, the local community um schools colleges attracting uh, the next generation uh, of women into the industry well uh, within weights to start with we have women at weights events um and um uh, we uh, this this is a, a it used to be now it's it's virtually again um a, an initiative to help uh, to assist young females within weights to start with and we as well uh, work with the young women charities to help reviewing their uh, series helping to not to inspire um to assist a lot of women across the country um, in in coming into the industry and we as well work with career ready um, promoting um, construction and different different roles within construction and this is part of a partnership with uh, career ready and an initiative at ways called build to last and uh, so we take on each of a senior or a mentor would take a mentee for a journey through their studies or be prior to go to university or to school or BTEC, uh, name it. So that will help to shape their career choice. And probably it's, it's I as I would see it, this is the, the time that for weights to, or any in for us in, in as respond is our responsibility in terms of as a construction uh, community to plant the seed of the future project managers, the future um, estimators, quantifiers, engineers, uh, site managers. We've got um, the, as well graduate schemes, which as well help to um, an internship as well. So this has been all addressed through uh, weights. Um, uh, uh, initiatives that help the young generation. Thanks, Ruby. That's great. I think just going back to a, a point uh, Susan made, you, you mentioned returners earlier, and uh, a question for you really. Obviously, the, un the unemployment rate is set to go up to something like two and a half million, I think, next year. And uh, I just wondered if, if you all, uh, as a panel, if you you see returners programs, um, you know, what is be best practice in terms of um, a successful returners program. How do we get more women to come back after maternity leave, um, after career breaks? Um, just wondered what your your thoughts are on that. Um, and I go to Susan first. Sure. So um, Skanska have a, a quite um, settled in now returners program, which um, I've only come across two of the returners in my day to day life, um, and I've found them just such valuable assets to our team because again they bring a diversity of thought because they have different life experiences I also think because of the effort that we put into our returners program and finding the right places for people that you are you're basically recruiting people who are tremendously loyal because you know of the way they've been treated you you get that back in in you know tenfold um and I also like that uh, one of the two uh, lady returners that I've been able to work with is also a member of our junior leadership team on one of our major projects. So the fact that she is a little bit older, but as a, cer a certain stage in her career, hasn't hasn't been something that's held her back from progressing in that future aspiration to be on the leadership team. So um, for me, there's no downside to a returners programme. And I think that the flexible working that we are all um, all involved in at this point in time is only going to make it more accessible but it, it is about using the right language when we go out because it's so easy to um, make construction not seem accessible and it, it absolutely is so I think it, it has to be about using the right language and the right approach and it can only benefit the industry as well as the returners. 
it's a it's a win win for me. And I, I appreciate this as a women in construction event, but do do you see returners programs actually targeting men as well as women? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they do. And and I I think the other thing that that helps with with returners and targeting you know across the board is. Um, the flexibility we're seeing in career pathways. So, you know, Ruby's talked about QSs and the engineers and architects and so on. But I think now that we're moving into that digital area, e era, it's also all about people who are more flexible. So perhaps a civil engineering graduate who goes into planning, who then has a, an aptitude for digital and then there goes into, you know, the digital rehearsal. It's it's not just about following one traditional path and, and working your way up the ladder that way. There's there's so much scope for development and progression, um, in a much broader way than the traditional way we used to work in construction. Great, thanks for that. Um, okay, Paula, have you uh, had any much experience in terms of returners program over at uh, uh, Briggs, isn't it? Oh, it's a difficult one to say. It's always a good opener. Yes, yeah, so a Briggs. We it's have. Briggs. Okay, Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first thing I say to young people is how do you say our name, which is always great. Um, I always get yes, it wrong, I, I still get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I, uh, we work very heavily with women in construction, so I have been part of the mentor program for probably about the last 18 months. Um, and I've got a, a lady at the moment who I mentor with two young children, and I sat down with her virtually the other day and said, let's look at your CV. I said, let's put down, you've been a CEO of managing your home, which is what you have. You've done logistics, you've done conflict management, you've got all these transferable <laughs> skills, which nobody ever thinks about. It's probably easy for me because of a career background. I understand that you you have to show that you're not going to have one size fits all. And certainly for male and females coming back to work, I think we need to look at internships a little bit more as an industry, not just for younger people. And certainly if you're in leisure or if you're a pilot at the moment or anything like that, where it's kind of disappeared your 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 career for the, for the point in time, you could move over and you could come back in. And um, I think also if you haven't had children, you might have had time out caring for a parent or a sibling or a child. Again, coming back into work and making sure the flexibility and the support. there. And I think as an industry, we don't shout about that necessarily enough. I know, Susan Skansky, you're very good that we are as well with our maternity, we've got very good maternity and paternity mm -hmm. uh, benefits. But I think as an industry, we don't really shout about that compared to say public sector. Um, and there's lots of uh, benefits in our industry. We have so many different things going on. As you say, every day is a different day. And almost, um, you know, why shouldn't you want to come and work for construction civil engineering it's always seen as a second thought and i think it should really be why shouldn't you because it's such a great role to be in um it's it is difficult because it's trying to change that mindset of if you are a female or a man you've had children you've been at home you lose your confidence and it is difficult to try and get that back and generally females when they go for jobs they will look at it and say well actually I can do one thing but I can't cover all of the desirables yeah. whereas men tend to just go yeah we can do it all and I think in interview we need to certainly have a balance of interviewers as well male and female not just men predominantly for the more senior positions and I think again straight away if you're introducing females it would be nice to have a buddy system straight away to say you know you're coming in as a graduate or undergraduate um, and even if you're coming in at a slightly more senior position, you still might be feeling a bit nervous after being off for quite a while, staying at home with, with children. And when you talked about internships, were you referring to older uh, people coming in terms of internships yeah. or young people or both? Or? or both, just to blend it. I mean, internships, you know, from the fashion industry, we had interns all the time and they ended up working for nothing. We can't do that. But internships, definitely 50s plus, men and women coming back, people looking after the carers at home and coming back into industry again. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that. We think people can sort of hit the ground running. And I'm talking about construction per se. Um, I think we need to be a bit more mindful that the support needs to be there and we can offer it. I mean, um, the, I mean, we know from COVID with the news reports in the last couple of weeks that uh, there's a massive issue for young people, isn't there? They, you know, young young people's unemployment next year is going to be uh, a significant uh, issue for for them, and and so it'd be really good to see you know companies step up and and 
and really try and recruit more young people into into jobs in terms of internships and trainees um, just to to help um, with with those people so um that's great no thanks thanks for that paula uh Sinead, um so uh have you experience of returnship programs and, and what's your your view on on that side of things yeah there is there is a returnship program in morgan central infrastructure and um, it's again aimed at you know people who've taken career breaks people may have gone on to do additional studies so um continued study um you know uh, women who may have had families so again returning back to the industry um it's probably my first time actually uh I've not heard of return to program till I came to Morgan and I could be mistaken there. I'm sure there was one in Costaine, but also in the supporting uh, network. So we also have the buddy system in Morgan Sindel. So um, it's a, a, a person who is there to um, just support, really emotional support and maybe a problem, share the problem half kind of thing. And, uh, you know, a support a system for that person coming back that's been through the same experience themselves. So been, you know, uh, had an extended period of leave and come back from whatever scenario and uh, back into working in construction. Yeah. And what would those buddies tend to be the sort of same gender or or is it more about experience? I think it's matched up um, uh, basically um, uh, where the person is coming back from. So it's uh, if it's someone who's gone to do study and they'll try and pair them up with somebody who's been through the same kind of additional study. Um, if somebody who's returning a uh, mother after maternity leave. Um, so they try to match them up through similarities of what an individual has been through and where they're coming back from. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Ruby, how yeah. uh, how uh, what's the experience of returnships in uh, in uh, uh, in Waits and in your experience? I'm not sure if I'll be able to comment on that. You can ask me about design and site. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a it's, there is a big challenge for the whole for the entire industry in terms of we require a lot of support as working moms. I mean, uh, at, at every level, and I'm sure all future generation will be looking for organization who promotes such strategies as because being a mother it brings a lot of with it with a, 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 a lifestyle change, but. It's just all about having a, an, an honest conversation at work about what can be done, what aid and transitions that can be an all intervention that uh, can work if there's a real commitment from senior uh, management. And um, I think this could be in, in a form of, I mean, as you mentioned, transition program. And I doubt that they, we, we don't have, I'm sure they would, there is a return program within weights. Right, thanks Ruby. So we got a couple of questions from the uh, audience that have tuned in. So I'll, I'll read them out and then we we'll, we'll go to Paula to see what is, and work our way along the line. Uh, so um, question from the audience, how can the industry better reach out to schools in order to, to dispel the myth that construction is a man's world? Do you think there needs to be more engaged? Well, we've done, we've done, we have, we've answered the question on engagement with schools and colleges. But uh, how, how do we break this myth that it's a, a man's world out there in the construction industry? We have to engage with the teachers and the parents. So as well as doing the career workshops to the students, we need to get the parents in a room or in a, on a video and talk to them about the options. And obviously with things like the degree apprenticeships, the higher apprenticeships, you know, particularly for uh, families that don't necessarily have the funding for their youngsters to go to uni. There are other options. Understanding that it is quite competitive, um, they can come out and have a qualification and potentially a job, but it's definitely engaging with the parents because as a careers practitioner, it's the hardest thing. You can you can sit down with a student, you can go through everything, and then they say, no, I, 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 my parents don't want me to do that. And you say, do you realise the opportunities you have, the money you can earn? You know, accountancy in the future will disappear. Quantities of bangs around for quite a while. So instead of looking at one route, look at another. And that's why I use civil engineering. The, the minute you say engineering, the ears prick up, the parents are engaged. So I think we need to do more of this with the PTA, 
getting involved with the governors. Um, sometimes with the academies, it's a bit easier because they're sort of on board um, trying to get their students to go to higher and further education. And I think the way forward is just looking in London. I mean, I'm from London, looking at London, what, look what's happening at the moment. So much building work. Every street has got some form of crane or, you know, high, people in high visits and the opportunities too. You know, it's a professional industry. Not everybody's going to be on site as a labourer. And I think it is changing. Consider it contractor scheme. We all involved in that. You know, all the awards that we go for, um, female um, industry like women in construction, which is high profile now. I think that really is, we're turning the ship. It's taking time, but I think it's definitely going to, it's going to change. But parents and teachers, we need to be behind them. In, ter in terms of the perception that it's a man's career, you know, for the, the boys in the, the teenage boys is, you know, it's the career for them to go into. But uh, I mean, I, I know from my experience, there's plenty of female uh, site surveyors. There's, plen there's plenty of female planners. I, I know a few uh, site managers, project managers. Uh, you know, there's, there's really um, opportunities for men and women, isn't there? Oh, there's, there's just so much. I mean, the great thing about our industry is you can start from the bottom and work your way up to the top. And there's very few other industries that you can do that. You could start as a labourer or a site manager or a trade and work your way up through the professions to become MD or CEO one day. And apart from maybe retail, there's nothing else that you can do like that. You've got to come in at a professional level. And I think it is changing. I mean, most sites you go to, obviously there are independent contractors who are much smaller than us, but they're all professional sites. Everybody wears a uniform. We've all got full point PPE. We've all got face masks on. We've all got the full, you know, everything's got sort of looks very smart. It's not we're standing there in a, in a jogging pants anymore. That image is gone. And I think with a lot of schools now, where we're building schools, they're seeing it firsthand, the opportunities that are there. And they see females going into work and 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 guys as well who who might not normally have gone into that industry so i think things are changing thank thanks paula and so, susan how did how do you see this perception that it's a career uh, mainly for for boys and for men do, how do we change that um image I think I kind of want to say what Paula said. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Paula. Um, I, I don't think it's about so much about getting people to getting, you know, girls and their parents and teachers to understand it's not a man's world. I think it's more about changing the perception of the industry full stop, because I think the, the kind of the traditional, perhaps slightly more macho reputation of the industry is probably putting off a lot of a lot of uh, of of young men and boys who might be thinking they might want to join and then thinking no oh, that's just a bit it, it's it's that's not for me so i think it is it's exactly what paula said it's about reaching the the parents and the teachers because they will ultimately however enthusiastic a child is they probably will have an element of the final say um and it's just so important that they understand exactly what a good career it is um, there's someone in my team who does a lot of work with local schools around engineering surveying and he has a he has a really practical application to this he makes sure he always drives a nice car and makes sure he parks it right in front of the classroom that he's going to see the parents and the kids and it's like look see you do what i do you can be driving this and i think yep. <laughs> that is an element of it you know it's not a case of someone walking through the school gates in a pair of muddy boots and a set of orange overalls it's it's lifting that appreciation of of what we do and exactly that it's a it's a it's a profession which is exactly what paula said i think with with young women as well I, and i don't really have an answer but i think it's a really relevant point is this um aspect that typically girls and women will go straight to the bit they can't do you know i've been in the industry for 30 years i'm i'm a, i was a successful project director when i applied for this role you know they kept giving me projects i'm taking that yeah. means they thought I had this and I did exactly the same thing I had to sit I got sat down by a friend of mine who had some hard words to say as I went well I've got the job description I can't do that bit he went yeah I know but you can do all the rest there's like two pages and there's one line really <laughs> but it's what we do and I think there is a bit of understanding that and not being impatient with with people who don't just jump in and dive in and go yay that's for me but appreciating that 
different people have different ways of, of coming around to what they want to do. And, you know, the thinkers and the reflective people, do you know what? They're probably the ones we want in our industry. So let's spend a bit of time and get to know them, give them a bit of support. The, the buddy system, I think, that Paula mentioned as well. Um, you know, if you have no one in your family who is in this industry, it's incredibly important to give a child that connection into this industry so they have someone they can go to and have someone they can talk to to say, well, my mum says this, my teacher said that, and you can have that debate and that conversation and support them through it as well, I think. No, great, thanks. So uh, we've got another question from the, the audience, and uh, it's one of the questions that I've got as well on my list. So um, for, for me, it's really important that we bring men along with us on a journey of inclusion, because uh, there are only around uh, 11, 12% of women in the construction industry. I think there's only about 3% of women out on site and so we're only really going to make a uh, change in the industry if men come on this journey with with women in terms of uh, making it more of more of an inclusive industry so um question for Sinead and uh, and Ruby uh, you know how uh, how do you make sure you know men don't feel alienated when we're talking around inclusion because there are plenty of women in construction events these days, aren't they? There are, yeah. Um, so for me in Morgan Sindel, it's all about awareness. So, you know, what is inclusivity? Um, we've got inclusivity e-learning online that it's a part of our core competency that everyone has to take, raising that awareness about diversity, inclusiveness. And, you know, when there are um, certain initiatives uh, like the Women in Construction or certain organisation networking that we bring men along as our allies, um, you know, we, you know, it's not just for, for, for women all, only, it's for men and everybody alike. And uh, we, you know, uh, work together uh, at the end of the day. We're just, uh, we're here to do a job and yeah, that we bring everyone along and, and raise awareness of what that is and what that looks like going forth. Great, thanks Sinead. Ruby, have you, uh, do you have uh, views on this? Because obviously, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion uh, is massively important for people of all backgrounds and uh, allies are so important and, and having men support the women and equally female senior leads as well support the, the younger women as well how, just how, how do we um, ensure that we achieve that in terms of allyship and uh, you know bringing men along on the journey and I think um, I think I was more um, focused on what um, uh, Paula and Suzanne were saying in the previous conversation uh, than talking about diversity. Because I, if I just want to tag one thing before I talk about the uh, um, inclusion and diversity, we are here starting as almost for the new generation as influencers. Uh, we, I mean, anyone who is attending this. Um, uh, this forum is looking at us as, as a role model and this is I think a start probably would take us a hundred years I mean to be completely you know we achieve our goal the first thing I think for to think about is passion I mean this is for a man or I mean for a young boy or a young girl and as Susan said if there's somebody in the family that is would be the the, the start of having that passion to go into a profession that is already existing in the family. Um, and I think this is something that I'm really uh, very, very not uh, from my personal experience as my father is, he used to be an architect and then a product director, international consultant. And then it was just for me, that is what I wanted to do till, till the rest of my life. And I enjoy every day since I decided to become an architect and then to a design manager and I'm probably I'm just following exactly what he was doing without even thinking about it. And <laughs> sorry, I had to say that. And in, in terms of diversity and, and inclusion, I think within within the current um, um, I won't say a trend, but it's 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 been the 
the drive for, for a lot of companies or uh, p uh, companies within the uh, construction industry. And uh, specifically for somebody like me who is working um, in, a, in a contractor or a construction from um, an ethnic minor uh, background, uh, I'm a female, I'm all the ethnicity or the minority that could be uh, in construction. A woman, um, uh, somebody of color, uh, from different ethnic minority, so even the, the I would say the obstacle could be more that for a female, a young female to to be thinking of coming onto the industry. But if I am there, they can see somebody who's like me. Then probably that would be um, an inspiration for them to to see that somebody have wear the shirt, they've done it, they can join. Do you think there are ways we can um, encourage men? Often men will feel frightened about speaking up in a women in construction type event, but actually we want to embrace men in terms of them supporting us and, and being felt that they're included in uh, events like this, for example, um, because without them, mm. women are never going to progress, are they, within the industry? So there's a, there's a synergy between men and women, and uh, you know they they need to help us, us as much as, but we also need to help them. I think starting from today's from this session, I'm sure I yeah, my colleagues on site they have me on the big screen there watching this. Um, <laughs> so now I hope that I made them proud, and uh, <laughs> and last year and women um, uh, in construction panel my whole team came to support me on uh, in Olympia and I thought that was amazing. So right. that I think it starts at the project level. Right, great. No, it's fantastic to have their support. So um, absolutely, we have the, with the technology you can wave them back, back, back at Thank home. Um, so uh, I mean you mentioned uh, visible uh, role models and uh, uh, for me if you can't see, uh, you know, somebody like yourself in a, in a senior position um, or in a successful career, then 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 you can't see yourself doing it either. Yeah, how how do we um, go about in the industry promoting uh, more, uh, you know, vis visibility of role models and and women that are really achieving uh, in all areas of the construction industry. And I go to Ruby first, and then we we'll go back along. I, th I think it's um, internship. I mean, there's a lot of avenues that we can, um, um, well, we can we can progress or we can take. And I think somebody have mentioned earlier. I think Paula, uh, woman in construction, is our first ally. Is very. Um, uh, well known at the moment that one of the organizations that's at supporting women in construction, their webinars or um, uh, their uh, partnership with construction companies, architects, engineer, and trying to attract more, um, I won't say the technical, the technical team or uh, the actually trades women to work as an electrician, bricklayers, which is, this is the difficult part. This is, I think, the next step where I know that there was only within the whole UK, there's one woman, the uh, crane driver, which is, yeah. And uh, so if we have crane drivers, site managers, uh, bricklayers, chippies and sparkies and all that, this is it, we are breaking in. So I think we just, just need an organization as women in construction and other universities as well. That right. is another, yeah, and another gate for us to to break into. Great, uh, thanks for that, Ruby. So, uh, Sinead, I mean, how do you see uh, we, as an industry, we can promote female role models so that they're they're more visible? Um, you know, this is how we're going to change uh, the 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 young people in terms of wanting to come into the industry. Yeah, it was the best way that we can actually shout about the, the great female role models that we've got in the industry. Well, I think uh, the fact that we're all here today is the first step. <laughs> it's 
it's not easy putting yourself on this pedestal of, you know, um, putting yourself out there. I will say it's my first time doing a Women in Construction event. Um, encourage your colleagues um, and encourage, you know, the people that we work with, uh, all the, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of my friends that are health and safety managers um, that I've met throughout the industry. Um, come on, do this engagement, as I said already, um, use social media, LinkedIn. Um, you've mentioned the, the, the female crane driver. I'm sure there's more than one out there. But yeah, put yourself out there and, you know, just give back, really. Um, get involved with your professional uh, body memberships go along to peer review interviews um you know just get um, a further female presence and uh, yeah just uh, shout about it yeah great thanks uh, Sinead. susan how do, how do okay. you is it is there um at skanska do you have a you know a, a, like a com strategy for um in terms of promoting greater visibility of female uh, construction workers for example I think we're probably not doing a great deal to do with construction workers on the ground, but I think it's a it's a it's coming. Um, and I think the first visible um visible sort of signs of that are a lot of our um a lot of our plant marshals and a lot of our um attendants, a lot of them are becoming women and it's a great it's a great job because they typically have that sort of less aggressive manner if they're dealing with difficult people in the public. Um, and I do recall um, a couple of years ago when we went to Australia, the, the Sydney Metro, I think it was, I did note, you know, you look around and you think there's something different. And I did pick up that I was seeing a lot of marshals at the, the access points that were ladies. They're all ladies. And it was a deliberate focused thing. So actually, we think this will be a better way of managing the public. Now, I, and I think that's a, a great thing to see. And a really different way of thinking about it. And I think that perhaps one of the best ways when we're talking about people on, on the ground and on, on the tools, if you like, of encouraging women into, into the industry will be to, to work with the works managers and sort of kind of strip down what are the skills that you want in this individual. And then let's go out and, and say, these are the skills we're looking for and see who's, who applies. It's, it's back to that, not having that male dominated language when you're advertising for positions because once you've got someone I, I firmly believe once once you get someone through the door and you're talking to them about the role i think you can persuade them i think that the blocker is before they even apply for me and um, because it's just too daunting and it's too it's too different and it's not what i do but there, there was an example that a lady who worked in hitachi gave when they were looking for um a more diverse workforce on their um production line they were actively looking for a more diverse workforce and they got no applications from women at all so they completely changed the job description they didn't call it a production line assistant they just said they were looking for people who were interested in working flexibly enjoy problem sol problem solving and were dexterous and then they got the applications I, I think once we get people through the door and we're talking to them then we've got a much better chance at the moment I think it's it's still too um it's just too daunting i think that's really interesting changing uh, the advertisement to mm -hmm. in terms of language how you can get a totally different group of uh, people applying mm -hmm. um paula um do you think uh can I, a question on uh, on role models do you think the industry is notoriously bad in terms of like website visibility, uh, poster visibility. Uh, when you when you walk around construction sites and you you, you get the posters on the outside. Um, in terms of actual using uh, role, visible role models in their marketing, uh, which will then actually obviously give greater visibility and then encourage more women into the industry. I think we need to look at our comms. I mean, as industry. We're very lucky at Boyig, as I said before, our, our chairperson is a female. She leads very strongly from the front, but obviously being female, it's that softer than maybe a man would have. Um, being French, when I talk to our French graduates that come over quite a lot and, and work on our sites, and I say to them, what's it like at uni in France? You know, how many females to male? It's like 50-50. Very, very different in Europe. Germany's very different. You know, it doesn't have this male-female thought process. It's much more about industry. You lead, 
school, you go into an apprenticeship, it's normally with an SME rather than a massive corporate company. They really um, uh, invest in their young people all the way through. And they don't really think of it as male and female. And, and coming from the fashion world, I left because I couldn't go any higher being female. I hit a, a plateau. So I came yeah. into construction and realized there was much more opportunity and more money ultimately and more flexibility with fashion didn't get two weeks holiday at Christmas I worked extremely long hours I was traveling a lot and that is the same in our industry but I think it's slightly different in that um, there are other opportunities but yes you're right I mean we do still have you know the guy with the hard hat and I think we need to see more women we do we do advertise a lot with females and the word in you know, a Susan said in our job descriptions and our, and even in our interview process to make it a bit more softer then you have to have x y and z because women will look at it and go no I haven't got that and as I said that example of a mum at home or a young woman who might be caring for somebody and been out of work for a while saying actually I've got those skills like yes I can communicate and I've got transferable you know logistics and conflict management if you've got kids it's conflict management all those things um, I definitely think the interview process I think is a blocker a lot of the times um, and I think CITB um, the CEO is a female at the moment, I think, um, and need to see these kind of uh, these these ladies, you know, let's see them more often. And almost like a, I don't know, you know, men tend to have mentors a lot more than women do. And we need to be having those proper mentors and internationally known mentors as well. Yeah, and it's interesting you say about the CITB. I know, I know the Charters Institute are building. I think it's got probably more women on their boards than, than men. So um, it's, uh, you know, that's, I suppose, trailblazing. I think. We do need to keep a balance because I think <laughs> well, sometimes it can go yeah. too far one way or the other. Yeah. And offices, yeah. you need to have a balance, don't you? You need to have a, a good ratio because we've all got different skills. You know, not all females are very female minded. Some are very male minded. I'm quite my male minded in my mindset and a lot of my male colleagues are not so we need to have a balance um, otherwise we have too many people with the same views too many chiefs i think sometimes as well yeah no thanks thanks for that paula so a question from me the audience again uh sort of i'm going to slightly change it a little bit just so that it works for for the panel um but um so women in construction that are mothers uh, trying to balance a, a career and uh, and actually bring up children as well. How how do you feel the construction industry cases for for mothers in terms of their job? And that's uh, we we'll go to Paula quickly because you're the you're the careers advisor. I just wonder what your advice would be on that on that topic. I I think we need to do a little bit more about job shares. Um, you know, people do work part time, but they might work two days a week. And then that role is not then continued. So I think you could have two um, male or females doing two days each and sharing a job. And I think that needs to be shouted out a bit more, maybe in construction, civil engineering. I don't think it's necessarily been thought about enough. Public sector do it quite a lot. I think that's something that we could certainly influence. Well, thanks for that, Paula. Susan, do you, do you see uh, visibility in, in Skanska? Uh, for uh, job sharing and mothers uh, balancing a career and and family life. Yeah, I do. We've got. I can think um, just offhand of a couple of um, you know very senior ladies in our company with young children who both work four day weeks. Um, and I I think that's a, that that was quite that was done quite early. So it's not like a new thing that's been going for a while. Uh, I think there was a little bit of moaning about it and a little bit of cattiness from other people to start off with but now it's just the norm so I think that is an accepted it's not it's no longer I think probably initially there was a bit of people holding up their hands and saying you'll never guess what they want to do now and now it's like yeah okay yeah we'll do that that's fine we keep this really valuable person in the, in our in our team and it's all good uh, I do think Paula raises a really good point we have not cracked job share at all I do wonder if the the more digital way that we're working now perhaps will will help that because I think one of the reasons we didn't crack it is because you had where, where was your handover because you know night shift to day shift the handover tends to be face to face if you're job sharing there isn't necessarily that hand where hard handover but if we're all working in the same digital environment maybe that's going to facilitate that um because we haven't cracked it and I, and I don't think we've cracked it with 
with anyone. I can't I can't actually think of any examples of job sharing in Skanska, although I mean I get lots of emails saying, well, you should have said this, you should have said that, and we got these yes. people, but I don't know any of them. But Every I'd like to say there are two, you know, there's a lady on the leadership team um, and another lady leading her own business unit who both work four days a week. Um, and that was before COVID and before um, digital working. So we have that, yep. and I think that that helps. I don't think, I don't think we've cracked it so well on projects. So I think for people who are on site, so it's maybe site engineers, graduate engineers, they may not see that possibility of, of, of that being accommodated. Um, and maybe that's where the career pathways that we talked about briefly mm -hmm. come in, where you perhaps diversify into something that is more accessible as a remote profession until such time as either construction on the sharp end um, adapts a bit more or until they are able to be on site more because their children are a bit older. It's really, it's so. really interesting what you say. I, I just wonder, obviously, traditionally construction has had, you know, quite a macho sort of culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, until COVID, going, going back to COVID, um, flexible working was really, really difficult to arrange. And, and I don't think uh, people were trusted. Uh, to, to be able to do their jobs uh, and work at home. And uh, I just wonder if that sort of culture sort of feeds into this this concept that you, you can't, that, that a job share wouldn't really work. But I mean, we've all proved that working from home does work. Why, why can't um, uh, job sharing work? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think, Paula, I think that it doesn't work. I think we're just saying that we don't, We've not cracked that, got it actually up and running. Um, yeah. And I and I do agree with you that that trust um, used to be an issue, but I think it depended on who you were working for. Um, mm. Because I know that I don't see why I would employ a bunch of really intelligent, experienced people and then say, "I'm sorry, if you're not sat next to me in the office, I don't believe you're working." Mm. So, for example, we had a, a a guy who, when his children had their first term at school, he would work from home two days a week so that he would take the kids to school two days a week and his wife would take the kids to and from school three days a week. So for their first term, they had that additional support. I, I never saw as a project lead that an issue, uh, that was an issue, but I do know other project leads who maybe wouldn't have done that. Hi, thanks. So I want to change, change the topic slightly. Um, it's, a, it's always a, a tab taboo topic, this one. Um, but I like to bring it up in these sort of sessions because it because it is a, a such a taboo topic, and uh, that's the subject of menopause. And um, menopause is, you know, it affects fifty percent of the population. But actually, men suffer from andropause as well. Um, and obviously, that that goes into affecting your well-being and how you feel when you go to work uh, for people at different stages of their life. And so uh, I spoke a question for Sinead for, for no particular reason, uh, going to you just because you're next on my next on my screen. She's I just not wonder, old enough. <laughs> I just wonder, I think it's a, a really, I, I didn't want to miss it out because we've only got about 10 minutes to go. But, um, yeah, you know, how, how do you see the, the subjects of a menopause being treated in the same way we talk about mental health? Um, and obviously other health and safety is issues. Yeah, um, do you see it as something we should be talking about or not talking about? Should it be normalised in conversation? Just like a fly in front of me. Um, yeah, I think um, absolutely. I think it's like any wellbeing initiative um, looks at all a different array of, of, of health issues and it's, if it impacts your work. Um, absolutely should be talked about. I mean, you know, we see every day in the in the side office, you know, if we're lucky enough to have an occupational health nurse to go in and have a chat, a wellbeing chat, you know, we've got employees assistance programs you, where you can ring up and get advice. Now, I, I'm not the expert on, on menopause, but I'm sure there is people better better positioned to um, have that conversation with individuals um, should they need be. But yeah, it should be talked about like any other um, health, health, uh, health issue. Okay, th thanks, Ashley. Ruby, do you, uh, what's your thoughts on this subject? Because um, 
I mean, I, I know from my own personal experience, um, I've I, I go I've gone through menopausal symptoms, and it's really it can be really difficult in terms of uh, your mental health, um, your people's sleep patterns, and uh, and obviously you know this is something that um, women at certain ages in their lives go through, um, you know, while they're still in the workplace. So um, do, do you see, how do, how do you see uh, the construction industry actually tackling this? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm giggling inside because we're talking about women in construction. And then in particular, for somebody like me, the main challenge is working for a contractor, and, and it, which is might prove to be challenging experience for, for, for some women and especially those who work on site. And they might feel at the time that they need to fit in and become one of the lads talking about menopause. To be accepted talking about menopause, I feel like we are gonna be a part, probably something that is in need, another part of education or to be talked about, not as a taboo, as you said, but how to bring us about, I am not quite sure, but I see in ways this is being discussed uh, in, in, uh, in our intra, um, uh, internet. Uh, and it's, it's been accepted by, my, uh, by uh, male counterparts, which is, I think it's a it's, it's, it's very good initiative. I, I never previously in any organization that I worked for, there was a talk about menopause. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's great. It's, it's, I think it's really. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a, yeah, it's a, something new. I would say a trend that will bring that into the workplace. Yeah. It's, it's hard enough to fit in to bring anything from the female world. Probably it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, but of course that's that's the problem. In the same way, mental health was two years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. That um, two or three years ago, mental health was a taboo topic. And yet, you know, yeah. one in four people suffer from a, a mental health issue uh, during their lifetime. And, uh, you know, similarly, you know, menopause affects women who work in the construction industry and, and, and obviously it affects their, their well-being. But, uh, no, I, I, sorry, go on. Sorry. No, I, I think in, in all cases, everyone has to feel that they are com comfortable in their own skin and be... And, and just to be the best version of themselves, wherever it is, menopause, no menopause, young, old, it's everyone has to feel their, whatever they can produce in their own merit. merit. Right, thanks, thanks for that. So my, my next question, we've only got about eight minutes. Um, I wanted to talk about meeting room culture and uh, how, uh, you know, if you're a young woman and uh, you're going into a room full of men, uh, how how um, how do you um, project confidence? How do you? Uh, I've I've been into some uh, some uh, wise meetings, and I find uh, quite a large percentage of women in the wise meetings have really low confidence. And, and how do we actually uh, empower women to have more confidence? And that's a, a question for Paula. I think one of the first things is you've got to practice feeling more confident in yourself. So if you're having a day that you're not feeling confident, first thing I say to anybody is wear a bright colour, red, pink, something like that will automatically make you feel more confident. You know, have a good haircut, put on that lipstick. You do not have to be loud to be confident. You can be quietly confident. And men don't tend to have that. They come into a room, they gauge who's the alpha male and they sit down and they find themselves. Well, women tend to sit back and observe maybe and that's always looked upon as not being confident maybe being a bit timid and if you're an introvert actually covid's been quite positive for you because you can sit in front of a screen and not feel everyone staring at you because you've got that distance so confidence is something you build on um you know look at look all the politicians on television none of them are confident they have they tricks and and, and little tips to try and make them feel more confident but for me color wear color lipstick um, you know, everyone at the moment is from the top upwards, isn't it? Nobody knows what we look like below. We could have jeans on or, or pyjamas or whatever. <laughs> we all look at you all to stand up. Can you all stand up? <laughs> yeah. 
I'm slowly <laughs> disappearing in the dark here because my light's oh. not great. But again, you just have to feel comfortable, I think. That's where confidence comes from, feeling comfortable in who you are. Um, and you don't have to be loud to, to portray it. That's great, great, great advice, uh, Paula. Thank you for that. Uh, Susan, have you got any tips for for improving confidence when you <laughs> you feel you're overwhelmed in a and I, and I have this myself, you know, with when you're sat in a room and there's 20 men and one one female, um, it, it is a challenge to get your voice heard, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it is at times. I think the other thing for me is actually the scariest people I've seen in those kind of meetings has historically been the alpha woman. When you right. walk in and you think, oh, there's another woman here. Good. Now, I'm not going to be the kind of a person who's going to go around to the other side of the table and go, hi, how are you? And give her a hug. But I would I do tend to look across the table and smile. And how often do you get the you get the look up and down? And you think, OK, I'm just going to sit down. And that's quite I actually find them much more intimidating than the men and I think the other piece of advice I would give um, people starting out is don't do what I did every time I had a dip in confidence I'd go and buy a suit I hate wearing a suit I look ridiculous I'm barely five feet I, I, I just don't do it so you know they're consigned to my wardrobe and it's back to what Paula said wear something you're comfortable in you feel confident I always like a nice handbag. That always works for me as well. So that's not that's working so well this year, but generally, that's the uh, way to go. That's <laughs> the, <hand> the pacifier. <laughs> I should be writing these down. Um, thank you so much, Susan. Really appreciate that. That's, that was great. Um, Sinead, have you got any top tips for, for being confident in, in meeting rooms, um, projecting yourself when you're surrounded by 20 men in the, in the room? Believe in yourself, number one. And um, yeah, you're you're there for a reason. You're on that team for a reason. And uh, speak up. And not everybody is going to agree, or some people will disagree. But you just need to have that conversation in the right manner. And yeah, um, as they said, there's no such thing as the stupid questions. So always ask questions and always speak up. But yeah, and believe in yourself. That's the main one. Yeah, that's really uh, great advice. I think. I mean, I've asked plenty of stupid questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not in the last two hours. Oh, the crap! <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, lastly to Ruby, uh, just because uh, I mean, you've you've had a great career, Ruby, haven't you? You've been uh, around the world. You've you've done been on some amazing projects, and you must have come across uh, you know times when you're you're in a room surrounded by twenty men, and you're you're thinking. You know how how am I going to get my voice heard? Um, what, what's your top tips? I think that the, is sometimes yeah, you just feel like, as I said, a minority. I'm the only woman within 20 men. It happens in different countries. I did a presentation to the municipal of Shanghai uh, at some time in 2003. I had a presentation Sheikh Mohammed Al Maktoum in Dubai, and there's more than 20 men. But at the time, as it, again is what I'm thinking about, what I'm being, what I'll be delivering and what I'm passionate about. And that would take the idea and thinking about the reason I'm there or standing or standing in front of all these men or being with all these men in a, in one room because of the not, not technical ability of all the skills that I've gained to be able to be in that room. And I think as uh, I think Paula or Jeanette said, just, just we are you think that you're unique and you are there for a reason and for a purpose and that would just take up all the idea of being a woman or a man my passion drives me that's great that's uh, some really fantastic uh, advice there so um we've nearly come to the end of uh, of this session i want to thank uh, we've, we have we had quite a few questions on the uh, on the chat, unfortunately, couldn't get to all of them, but I think some of them cross uh, uh, referenced other questions, so uh, that's why we didn't get to, to ask all of them. Um, so I just want to give each uh, panel member just uh, a one minute, uh, just any advice for um, somebody that wants to come into the industry. Um, we go to Paula. Be Your yourself. Top one, one top tip, yeah, be, go for it. Be yourself. I'll do another and have a good sense of humor. I think it's really important to be able to laugh 
and laugh at silly things that you do if you need to do it and not take it too seriously. They just say, if you're going to a room full of men, feel confident that you're there, you've got the job, you know you can do it, and just just be you. Great. Thanks, Paula. Susan? And again, what Paula said. Um... All right. That's all right. <laughs> That's right. We can all agree. <laughs> I think enjoy because there's there's no point in going to work every day and not enjoying it. Um, you are entitled to be in the room. That's why you're in the room. And you know what? A lot of the time they're probably more scared of you than you are of them. So recognize that um, and, and just be kind to yourself and don't beat yourself up. Because I think as women, we can be overly harsh critics of ourselves and things that we would never dream of saying to anybody else we will quite happily repeat in our head um, and it's just not necessary be, be good to yourself and enjoy this is frankly the best industry in the world i think that's a re really really important point to take home and and looking after your own well-being you know i, I know myself i um, you know, I do a very busy job. There can be a lot of pressure, but I, I have to remind myself to to be kind to myself as well. So no, that's great. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Sinead, your your top tip. Uh, yeah, go for it. Why not? Um, Fed <laughs> is a very very rewarding industry. Uh, probably top tip. Um, be flexible. Uh, no day is the same, and I'm sure everyone knows that who's on the call today. Um, you know, resilient, and the main thing for me is to have the right attitude. Um, so the right attitude, two things, right? I mean, we can always get qualifications, learn, gain experience, listen to people around us, gain skills, knowledge, but as long as we've got the right attitude to do it right, we're in a good place. Brilliant. No, that's fantastic. And Ruby, you're the last. Uh, what's your, um, your your top tip for for some for you know, females that want to join the industry? Or well, come back into the industry? Tip is always for women are often assumed to start a careers with limited expectation and not to go beyond a certain level. This is for as starting as an architect, we work long hours in construction. You start early on site, but from my own experience, this is not the case. The sky is the limit. You have to believe in yourself and then believe that women can bring a great asset to any organization and just be yourself as all the panelists say, just be yourself. That's fantastic. So um, it just leaves me to, to close uh, today's event, uh, the Women in Construction event for 2020. I think we'll all be glad to see the back of 2020 for a number of reasons, but not, not the end of this panel. Um, and, and so um, I hope uh, everybody can join us uh, for the uh, London Build uh, cocktail event, which is coming up, I think, in about 10 minutes or so. Um, so you'll be on a like a speed, not speed date, but speed uh, chat about diversity and inclusion uh, in the construction industry. Um, so I really hope uh, you can all uh, join us for that in, in about 10 minutes time. Um, so I'm just lastly, I wish you, um, you and your family as well during this difficult time. Um, my heart goes out to anybody that's been suffering from uh, COVID-19 or has suffered a loss over the last year. So I just want to wish you well from myself and all the panellists and um, all the best for 2021. So um, it's bye from me and uh, thank you to Paula, Susan, Sinead and Ruby. Cheers. Bye. 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 <laughs> See you next year, hopefully in Rio. Yep. Yeah, no, that would be good. Yeah. I'm hoping Selena is going to come online. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for moderating, Christina, and to all of our panellists, Sinead, Susan, Paula and Ruby. That was a fantastic discussion. So many great questions coming in from the audience as well. So thank you everyone in the audience that has also tuned in for the final session of the day. Um, final session, but we've also got a networking event taking place now. So if you jump on the londonbuildexpo.com forward slash w hyphen i hyphen c, you'll be able to register for the speed networking cocktail reception. Basically, you'll get um, five minutes networking uh, to discuss our key talking point, which is what are you doing to drive equality, diversity, inclusivity, and change within the construction industry. So we hope to see you all online in the next 10 minutes. 
Uh, so we would love to see you again for tomorrow's session, uh, which is taking place at 10.30 in the morning. So we've got a session on bridging the skills gap and future proofing construction. So it's at 10.30 a.m. tomorrow. But again, we hope to see you all for the final session of the day. So thank you once again to all of the speakers and to everyone in the audience. I hope you're all well, staying safe, and we hope to see you all soon. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.